I was an executive producer. I was the guy that got the book, got it together, put the package together, and then, you know, I really just kind of stepped out of the way. And as far as I was concerned, the, the job was done. Uh, what I had attempted to do was done, and I waited for the results. Uh, it was never really my intention to get that involved uh, with the actual day-to-day. -day. I didn't consider myself a filmmaker by any means. I considered myself a theater owner. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> it wasn't until uh, Alling too that I actually became a fil filmmaker, to many people's chagrin. <laughs> either worked for uh, motion picture theater companies and then when I was in my young in my early 20s I uh, started my own company with a partner and owned about ended up about 40 screens in Southern California and Arizona I was walking through them all one day and I saw the book The Howling out on a little kiosk out in front and it said on the back you know in the tradition of Stephen King and uh, I picked it up and I read it that night and I absolutely fell in love with the book and being a theater owner, I thought, well, this makes a great movie. Oh. <laughs> I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, absolutely no idea whatsoever. I went and I tracked the book down, uh, found out that it had, been, it had been optioned by Warners and that had expired and a fellow named Jack Conrad owned the rights at that point. And I tracked Jack down. Uh, he was living in Malibu. He was a young uh, beginning filmmaker. He was actually about my age, probably. Uh, and he, he had the rights, and he had written the script, and he wanted to direct it. And to me, you know, the book was good. I read the script. I didn't. I thought the script was pretty good. And uh, who was I to think that, gee, making a movie with an unknown director and an unknown screenwriter <laughs> would be difficult? So I actually uh, made a deal with him, and then I took it to uh, through a, through a distribution out through a through a distribution arm at at Avco, a good friend of mine, Bill Shields. He got it into development. AVCO then brought on Dan Blatt as the exec co-executive producer with myself to uh, supervise it. And for this is, from this point on, you know, I'm, I'm, I can only tell you what I know uh, through what people have told me. Uh, Jack's concept didn't fit with with uh, Avco's, or with Dan's. Dan brought Joe Dante on at that point. And Jack ended up as a, as a producer on the, on the film. Uh, and obviously, uh, they went a whole, whole new different direction than the book. And uh, the rest is history. I mean, uh, you know, for a real small budget, a lot smaller than what they tell you, uh, it was quite a film. It was quite a film. Avco had a, I think it was two years, I'm not positive, it may have been one year, uh, option on a sequel. They chose not to exercise it. I had a partner, Bob Pringle, who at that time had just become my partner and we were going to start trying to produce films, and he had suggested to me that we go and try to buy the rights to uh, part two. We made a deal with Hemdale, with John Daly and Derry Gibson, 
and we went into pre-production, but we never really knew whether we had the funding or whether it was always John saying, "Well, we're, we we think we got it. We're gonna we're we're you know continue moving forward." I even it was in London. Bob was in London uh, when all of a sudden we got this notice that uh, there was a deal made with the. Uh, Czechoslovakian government and that we were shooting there and uh, Philippe was rushed over there. For Philippe it was extremely difficult there was it, it was a, a hard currency deal for for you know for in trade for labor and equipment the equipment was 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 old and, and uh, you know not up to date the labor, I'm not saying anything about them personally, but you know, the, the, the way of life, the things were there, didn't encourage anybody to, to uh, put anything extra into it. So we had this giant crew, which half of them would be drunk by uh, six or seven o'clock <laughs> in the, or five, four or five hours into the shoot. And we would be happy with that because the drunk, the drunk ones would just then just go over and sit underneath the tree and, 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 and drink. And the ones that really wanted to work were the ones that, were, that we, we ended up with a, with a uh, tighter crew. Christopher Lee, although uh, I'm not sure that he thinks this is one of his proudest moments, he was an absolute total gentleman. He was an absolute total gentleman to work with. 100% professional under, under really trying circumstances. A fabulous person, fabulous guy. Uh, just, a, just was a, just a pleasure. I have nothing but good stuff to say about him. No, no, I mean we were in some very, very rural and some very rough conditions for for somebody of his stature, and he took it with a grain of salt. He, he, he was there was no crying by him by any, at any time. Sybil Danning's repeated topless shots. Yes, it was John Daly. It was his decision. Uh, nobody knew it. Nobody saw it coming uh, until uh, till the end. And then it was basically, what? 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 When you looked at it, well, what the hell is that? <laughs> what? What? You know, this will. And Sybil was angry. Uh, Sybil was not happy with that. Philippe came to me and said that he would like to uh, make a sequel, another one. Uh, I don't want to say to redeem, re redeem that, because uh, I didn't think Howling 2 was that bad. I actually enjoyed it. Uh, uh, anyway, he wanted, he wanted to, to, to uh, do an Australian sequel, uh, obviously a whole, different, you know, whole different setup kind of a thing. And he uh, personally was able to raise a good portion of the financing, almost all the financing, through the uh, 10BA Australian program, because he's, you know, he's an Australian citizen. And um, I was able to get the, the balance. And Philippe wrote the script, and Philippe directed it, and really, really basically uh, produced it. It was over a little bit over the top, and I think that was the intention. I think that was the intention of Philippe when he directed it, and, and the intention when he wrote it. Uh, and I thought it came out quite well. And you know, at Howling Three, there's like two different audiences. There's there's two different feelings. You get uh, some people that really, really, really like the film, and then you get people that don't. I mean, uh, uh, it certainly drew. I think other fans than just the ones that were uh, straight Howling fans. Opened up a whole new door. The basis of, the, of Howling 4 is the book. And it was with, I was sitting with Harry Allen Towers one day, and I said, you know, in the first one, they, they did a portion of the book, but they didn't do the book. Why don't we just do the book? Let's do the book, the re, you know, really tell the story that was written by Gary Brodner. And that's, of all the Howlings, that's the closest to the story that was in Gary's novel. Uh, Harry Allen wrote it <laughs> under, under, Harry was a character, uh, under, under some name, I don't even remember 
what it was. And Harry was a character. He wrote it, he knocked it out in about three weeks. Uh, we, uh, we, we made a co-production deal which with a South African co company, uh, which was a disaster. Uh, where we ended up having to loop the whole film back here. I mean, it, our sound stage was a tin roofed building on an airport <laughs> outside of Johannesburg. <laughs> and it rained all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that was our sound stage. <laughs> By the time when we got back, uh, we ended up having to re-loop the whole film. I had to bring everybody in and, and redo it. The Howling Five, uh, shooting the Howling Five in Budapest, uh, I loved the film. And I loved the, uh, the we, we had this gray old castle set, which was coming down. Uh, we had problems. The director and the leading actor were fired on the first day of filming. We brought in a Neil Sundstrom, who was the uh, camera operator as the director, and he did a fabulous job. There was a t-shirt that was made by the production management uh, that said on the back of it, I survived room 401. Because if you went to room 401, if you got called to a meeting in room 401, you were you were on a plane the next day, <laughs> going back to your, your place of origin. <laughs> and uh, uh, there, was, uh, there was a few of that. But in the end of the day, I, I liked the film, and uh, uh, it was fun to shoot. I mean, once we were over the hiccups, it was, uh, it was a labor of love, and everybody in the end enjoyed it very much. My partner, Bob Pringle, and Kevin Rock worked very closely in developing the script. Uh, it was a different feel. Uh, it's actually my favorite movie of all of the, all of the sequels. Uh, it was shot here in California. It was shot up at uh, Lake Piru. The, the circus scenes were shot out by Magic Mountain out in the field. Directed by Hope Perillo, who was a had been a primarily a unit production manager up until then, but uh, again, we were very limited in our budget. Uh, much more expensive to shoot here than where we had been accustomed to shooting. And we met with Hope, and uh, uh, she really wanted to give it a go, and we, we really felt she could do it, and I, I think she did a very honorable job. She did a very good job. It was different in that, yes, there was different monsters, but it was primarily, you know, the werewolf story. I mean, like I said, we were very, very, very pleased with it. Uh, unfor unfortunately, what happened then was that was just as the, uh, the video market imploded. And while we made our normal deal f for the U.S., and then we were going, we were going to sell it on the, on the uh, foreign market, uh, Vestron and uh, or, uh, you know Fox and everybody had just kind of rolled up their their uh, bricks and gone home and we were selling it country by country and uh, that was not as successful as I had, had hoped. So we were at the point of having to make a decision whether to go forward with another one or whether it was done. My partner in England, Ed Simons, felt there was still some, some, something left there. And he and Clive put together the notion, well actually Clive put together uh, the notion of shooting a, a, a small film using bits and pieces from the other films. And inserting it, and he shot it. This is, this is all I can tell you <laughs> is, is that I think he shot it in a place called Pioneer Village. I never saw the script. We were never involved in, the, in any of the actual making of the film. We never saw, I never saw the film until uh, 
I think, until we came out in, in, on the video store shelves. You know, you would think that Howling 7 would be the death of anything, <laughs> any microbes that would be alive. But after a length of time, uh, I got together with the, the producer of, of The Howling Reborn, Joel Castleberg. Uh, I think it was, it was early uh, 2000, I think two or three, um, maybe three, maybe four, I don't know. Uh, and his concept was is that he wanted to, to come back and, and either remake the original or make a big Howling, that enough time had passed between Howling 7 and, and today. And uh, it was a decent film, uh, shot in Montreal, did pretty well in the DVD market. Um, I think they had hoped for a, a, a much bigger film, but they made a, you know, the picture was made on a very small budget uh, in their defense. Uh, I know what that's like. Uh, so there weren't a lot of options, uh, and it was a good story, and uh, uh, nothing for anybody to be ashamed about. <laughs> the Howling's been a lot of fun for me. I haven't made millions of dollars, uh, which everybody assumes I have, but uh, I, I totally enjoyed it. I, you know, it's take, it's, I'm going to be 66 next month, and it's, it's been in my life for 31 years or so, uh, which is quite a time for uh, a, a single, single any, you know, even to own a company or anything. Uh, I've traveled all over the world with it. Uh, I've met, you know, some great people, production people, star, uh, actors, uh, actresses. Uh, I, I've totally enjoyed it. It's been a great ride. It's been a very, 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 very enjoyable ride. Uh, as, as far as making the films, as far as distributing the films, getting paid—that's another story. <laughs>